Well, good morning. Good to see all of your smiling faces this morning. Thank you for coming out and being a part of our service today at Victory Church here in beautiful Chattanooga, Tennessee. And thank those of you online that are joining us this morning. We appreciate you being a part of our service. Uh, we, we like that, uh, that you join us, that you put a demand on the Word, that you are, are receiving things. We appreciate all your comments that you're, and your uh, uh, input that you're giving where our services are concerned. Thank you for doing that. This morning, I want to continue... Uh, the last several weeks we have been talking on the family. This is uh, uh, part five this morning, and two of those services Beth has helped me. And the reason for that is because when I, when I start talking about the wives, I don't do a really good job at that. Because one of the things that I learned years ago was, it, <clears throat> if there's anybody in the church you don't want mad at you, it's the women folk. You don't want them mad at you. So, and, and what, what, I, what would happen is when I would start talking about the wives, inevitably... I would go back talking about the husbands because what I have found over the years it is usually when the husband's doing what he's supposed to be doing, the rest of the family falls in line like it's supposed to. So that's why I keep going back to that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some of the women, to be honest with you, I don't blame them for the way they act. Yeah. So I, I just, that's, that's what, so Beth. Uh, help for the last two weeks and she did did a really good job she's uh she is such a blessing as, as i mentioned you know we've known each other since we were 12 years old so we have we've known each other a long long time dated in high school and then wound up getting married and the rest as they say is history i would like for you to turn with me in your bible this morning to uh our jumping off scripture which is in first peter chapter three here in first peter chapter three i love the way that uh, verse 7 states this. And we're going to look at verse 7, and then uh, we're actually going to go back to verse 1 and, and read up to this point, because there's some things in that section I'd like to share with you today. Verse 7 says, Husbands likewise dwell with them, that's talking about their, them as their wife, with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel. And we've talked about this several times. That's talking about physically. That's not talking about Anything else, okay? Just uh, physically. And, as, and I love this next part. And as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, I want, to, uh, I, I want to put you in remembrance of something because I know that most people's brains leak. So you may have forgotten a few things that we said five weeks ago. And, and I, I want to share with you that when things were set up, and we learn this, and it's, and it's important to keep in mind. We look at how God's structure is. We look at how God sets things up. And the way that we do that is we go back to the book of beginnings and see the way that He set things up. And how many of you know that the world is not operating right now the way that God designed it in the beginning? Sin came into the world, and, and it wreaked havoc on this place. It wreaked havoc not only with people, but, but the Bible says it even affected the very planet itself. So a, a lot happened when sin, and I'm talking about sin, capital S, big sin, depravity, when it came into the garden. And we find there in uh, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, it says, And God made them male and female, and He gave them dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowls of the air, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And so we see there that he, he, he told them to have dominion in the earth and to replenish the earth. And then at the end of that, it says, and God blessed them. And that word bless means to empower. So he empowered them to do what it was that he called them to do. Now then, I, I, this, and this is the part that I want to emphasize where this is concerned. God's original design. Matter of fact, the first one we talked on this, I put divine design was the name of the, was the, name of the sermon. God's original design, His divine design for operating in authority on the earth was a husband and wife operating together. That's the way that He said He could have done it any way He wanted to, but that's the way that He set it up. Now then, wouldn't it make sense to you that the enemy would attack that design? So it's not an issue on whether something is politically correct. You can get so bogged down in all of that junk. 
you have to realize that any the attacks that are coming against the family, that are coming against sexuality, all that stuff is an attack of the enemy to rob man from exercising his God-given authority in the earth in spreading the gospel. It's an attack on the gospel. Okay? So when you remember that, when you keep that in, in mind, when you keep that at the forefront of your thinking, it helps you realize that where your marriage is concerned. Listen, you're going to have disagreements in your marriage. You're human. You know, you, your, your wills, your thinking didn't blend into one. You're still an individual. As a matter of fact, my wife reminds me of this. If we both were the same, it would really be boring. We're different people. And I remember when I got the revelation that my wife adds to me. She sees things that I don't see. You know, sometimes men, we just kind of go stumbling through life, you know. We're just not, sometimes we're oblivious to things going on around us. And our wives aren't that way. Our, our, our wives are very keen and astute. They're, they're watching out, and they're watching out to help protect the family. Uh, so it, it, when, I, when I began to learn, she sees things from a different perspective than I do. Not she is against me. We have oftentimes we think too much about how when somebody has a different opinion than us, we automatically think they're against us. I mean, my goodness, that's going on all over this, in this country right now. When somebody has a difference of, op of opinion, we label them enemy. No, it doesn't, because somebody has a different opinion from you doesn't mean that they're against you. And, and that's what happens where arguments are concerned. And I, as a matter of fact, we were talking uh, when we were riding in this morning. And, and Beth said, you know, one of the big things that happened with us that we, and, and thankfully we learned this early on. Now, we've been married over 40 years. And, and thankfully we learned this early on in our marriage. And that is, there are times that we'll get into a lively discussion. And one of us will say, you know, we probably don't need to talk about this any further. We, we, we probably need to drop this right now. Now, when we were younger, we wouldn't do that. Because remember, when you're younger, your goal is to win the argument. And as we talked last week, men, you can't. Okay? You're just, you're just not going to do it. She has more words than you. She thinks faster than you do. You just, you're, 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 you're not going to win the argument. So when you, when you get into these disagreements, when you, when you figure out, when you get the revelation one day, the goal is to solve the problem and for us to maintain peace in our marriage. The goal is not me to prove that I was right. Too often times we get into arguments and what we, what it, the argument is over a really big, I told you so. I told you not to do that and you did it and you see what's happened. If you'd have just, listen, we want to prove that we were right. Uh, that's, that's not the goal. The goal is to walk together in unity as heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. One of the things also that you need to recognize, whenever you find yourself starting to get pitted against one another, red flags ought to go up. Sirens ought to go off. You ought to realize what it is that the enemy's doing to you. He is trying to turn you against each other You'll no longer operate in agreement. And when you don't operate in agreement, your prayers are hindered and your faith's not working and the enemy starts wreaking havoc in your family. Don't do that. Operate together in agreement where you can. Now then, it's really important. Listen, <clears throat> when, I was, when I was little, and, and sort of this day, now, I am more of a dog person. Okay? I like dogs. And, and from the time Beth and I first got married until Andrew went off to college, we had German Shepherds. And, and, and we had them, we, we bred them, we trained them, we, I, we just love German Shepherds. I like the, the, uh, the breed to me is predictable. I like the way they, they uh, uh, operate with the family. I, you know, just, I, I, I like German Shepherds. Well, my wife kind of decided she wanted some cats. And so we got a little German Shepherd puppy, eight weeks old, and some 
lady in our church, bless her darling heart, she decided we needed a little kitten to go with that puppy. And so, kind of Andrew had the, you know, the dog was going to kind of be his, and so she brought our daughter Amy a little eight-week-old kitten. Now, there's a little bit of difference in size in an eight-week-old German Shepherd and an eight-week-old kitten. And that little kitten went out and cl- went over and climbed in that puppy's dog bowl. Just climbed up in it and lay, and lay down like it was going to sleep because the size of the bowl was perfect. Little kitten got in there. Well, Greco, our German Shepherd's name Greco, uh, he, he came over there to see what was going on and that little kitten went pow! And he backed up, and I told my wife, I said, I like that cat. <laughs> and, and, and that little kit, uh, Amy named her Missy, that little kitten won me over as far as cats are concerned. So now I, I, I like both of them, okay? My little bitty wife right now, bless her darling heart, she's looking for British short hair cats. My, my, I don't know if you know anything about those, but sweet Lord Jesus. So we're probably going to be having some cats around the house before long. So, but you don't have to change each other. You don't have to, look, look, it's okay to be a dog person and a cat person. She can like a different car than I like. She can like uh, a different style in house. She can like different, you know, restaurants. It's okay to be different. But in matters of faith, when you're exercising your faith, you must be in agreement. And if you're not in agreement, as Beth explained last week, when you're not in agreement, that is where submission comes in. When you cannot get in agreement in the areas where faith are concerned, that is where submission comes in. Now, we're, I'm going to go back to, check, to verse 1, and we're going to read through because I want to, to bring some things to your attention here. So in 1 Peter chapter 1, I mean chapter 3 and verse 1, Wives likewise submit yourselves to your own husbands, then even if some do not obey the word, they without the word may be won by the conduct of their wives. Now, one of the, the image that I want you to get out of your head is this. We're not talking about wives being little mousy. Just, just, yes, dear, whatever you say. That, that's not what we're talking about here. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells husbands and wives to actually submit one to another. <clears throat> I said, the Bible also says for husbands and wives to submit one to another. Why? Now listen to me, this is very, very, very all of this teaching that we're doing on where the family is concerned pertains to exercising authority in the earth, exercising authority in your life. The, the, listen, the devil doesn't give two hoots about you, but he does care about your authority. And if you're not going to use it or you misuse it, he will take it from you. That's what happened to Adam and Eve in the garden, okay? He, he, he didn't care about that. He took their authority and then he used it on them. And that's what will happen. The enemy will take the authority from you and your household and then turn it back on you and, and destroy it. So we don't want that to happen. So we have to pay attention to one another. So it, we exercise authority, and I've shared with you before, a husband and wife standing on the Word of God are the most powerful things on this planet. You cannot be defeated. If the two of you are in agreement, agreement, standing in faith, standing on the Word, you cannot be defeated. The enemy knows that, so he tries to get you pitted one against another. So when you see the word submission, don't think... Do anything that the other person says. That's not what it's talking about. Submission is being... Think of submission in terms of the flow of authority. Doesn't the Bible tell us that? Doesn't the Bible tell us we love to quote this verse over in James 4, 7? We love the part that says, Resist the devil and he'll flee. Well, there's a first part to that verse of Scripture that says, Submit yourselves therefore to God resist the devil and he will flee. So submission is the first step towards exercising authority. Wives, it's very difficult for you to be submitted to your husband if your husband's not submitted to the Lord. It's a flow of authority. Okay? Ladies, or husbands, I told you I always pick on the husband. 
Husbands, if the wife sees in you a rebellious attitude towards the things of God, guess what? You're putting that seed in the ground. That's what's going to come back to you. Remember we talked about the husband is the head of the wife. I'm getting so far ahead of myself right now. I've got about seven plates spinning up here. Well, I'm trying to finish today, and I've got a lot of loose ends I need to. Okay, well, uh, let's go back here to verse, verse 1. Notice that also it's talking about here, submit yourselves uh, to your husbands, and notice why it's telling you to do that. So that you're, so that you're no good for nothing, stinking, unbelieving husband can be saved. Your attitude towards him, you acting in godly submission towards him, can cause his attitude. I have seen this happen many times. Where a, a wife will operate towards her husband in, in godly submission where she can. You understand there is a limit. There, there, there is a certain, a certain point that, that you can operate up to a certain point with an unbeliever. And I have seen this happen time and time again. And, I, and I'm thinking of one person. I mean, this guy, I mean, you know, if you ever thought that there might be possible that somebody couldn't get saved, this guy might have been it. Now, I know Jesus died for everybody. And I know that, that, that the, his blood cleanses whoever calls upon him. I, but this guy was a stinker. And this woman, she was, she was nice to him. She treated him with reverence and respect. And lo and behold, he showed up for church one Sunday. And boy, did the Lord have a surprise for him. He got saved. That, they actually got saved and healed in that service that day. Praise God. That's a good thing. And she had acted that way towards him for years. Now, like I said earlier, usually when, when that's the other way around and it's an unbelieving wife and a believing husband, that usually seems to operate better. That, that seems to happen quicker than the other way around because, doggone it, sometimes men are just stubborn. Because we've, we've been taught since we were little bitty that my generation and the generation before me thought that it wasn't manly necessarily to go to church. So, thank God that, that women held the church together. They were the ones that took the children to church. So the men could stay home and watch football or whatever. Uh, and, and, you know, we've started to see things change where that's concerned. But, but oftentimes, the wife is the more sensitive or the more spiritual one in the family. And if she will operate in a manner that is of godly conduct, it will, the, the husband will start seeing it. Some are just a little faster to see that than others. When they observe your chaste, uh, King James Bible says, uh, chaste conversation. I like the way the New King James says it here because that word conversation means conduct or behavior. So when they observe your chaste conduct, and that word chaste just simply means pure, accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment, the, the merely outward arranging of the hair, wearing gold, or putting on a fine apparel, Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is, a very, is very precious in the sight of God. Two things about this. In verse 3 right there, I want you to notice something real quick. How many of you, you know, there, there's, and, and for whatever reason, I don't see this as much as I used to. But, you know, back years ago, you would, you, all right, women can't wear makeup. I mean, it says it right here, somewhere in there. I'm not sure where, but somewhere we got it out of that. Women can't wear makeup. They can only wear drab colors. They have to have their hair a certain way. And did you, ever, you know, and the men, they can wear whatever suits they want, whatever jewelry they want, stuff like that. But oh no, not the woman. So, I want to bring something to your attention. Where it says right here that women can't wear jewelry. They can't arrange their hair a certain way. I want you to notice another part in this verse of Scripture. So if, 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 if we're going to put this on women, that they can't wear makeup, they can't wear jewelry, well, the end of that verse of Scripture is they can't wear clothes either. Right? That's just ignorance gone to seed. You know, I mean, really, you have to have help to misunderstand that. You have to sneak up on that kind of ignorance. 
Well, yeah, well, bless God, we can't, they can't wear makeup. They can't. There's a whole lot of things I could say about that right now, but I'm not going to. You know, the, even an old barn looks. Well, no, I'm not going to. Not going to. And the reason for this, what he's talking about is you're not going to impress your husband spiritually by the way, by, 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 by your outward appearance. The thing that is going to draw him is the, the person that's on the inside of you. The loving person that's on the inside of you. For in this manner, the former times, the holy went... Uh, no, let me back up, verse 4. Rather that it be the hidden person the heart with the incorruptible seed of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious... Let me read that again, ladies. Of a gentle and quiet spirit... Just one more time. A, a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Now, I've, I've got to show you this verse of Scripture. In Proverbs chapter 7. Now, I want you to come back. and We're coming back here to 1 Peter. But Proverbs chapter 7 and verse 11. Go ahead, let's put that up on the screen. Okay. Proverbs seven eleven. She is loud and rebellious and her feet don't stay at home. Now, in the preceding verse, that describes a particular woman. Verse 10 says, And there a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and crafty of heart. Now listen to me. I didn't say that every woman that is loud is a harlot. That's not what I said. Okay? Don't go out of here saying, That's right, that Pastor Seymour believes any woman that speaks her mind is a harlot. I did not say that. What I'm saying is that, listen, let me put it this way. Have y'all have y'all ever been to a to a a gathering of some kind? A fellowship of whatever. And you know, you meet somebody for the first time and you meet a couple, and the man is is kind of quiet, and and the woman is really loud and boisterous. When you leave that party, you don't say, you know that man? He's married to a spiritual giant, isn't he? That's not what you're thinking. When you leave, we go, you know, we need to put Homer on our prayer list. <laughs> He's got his work cut out for him. My point being, when you, when you are around together as a couple, and, and the woman is loud and boisterous, I, I didn't say not having an opinion or speaking. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about an attitude that is rebellious, and loud about it. Solomon wrote that that is the way that, that that's a characteristic. That's the, that's the way a harlot acts. So don't do that when you compare that to First Peter chapter 3 of a quiet spirit. Do you all understand what I'm talking about here? I, I'm, I'm not telling. I mean, you know, if, if any of you have been around my wife more than 30 minutes, you know she is a very opinionated woman. And usually her, her opinions are really good, especially when they agree with mine. But, but she, uh, you, you know, and, and, and one of the things that I learned, and this was a difficult thing when we were first married, when I learned to pay attention to her, when she, when she would say, and she was so sweet, she would say, you know, I don't think I'd do that if I were you. Oh, yeah, I, I know what I'm doing. I'd go ahead and blunder on through something and, and wind up realizing in the middle of it, you know, I probably should have listened to what she had to say. So, again, when you realize you're working together as a team, and that should, be your, that should be your goal, you're not working against one another, that's a really good thing. Okay, back to 1 Peter chapter 3. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women, verse 5, who trusted in God, who adorned themselves, became submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Who, now listen. I, I told my wife one time, I read that verse of Scripture, and I said, Sweetheart, Sarah called Abraham Lord, and I think that's what you should do. You should start calling me Lord. She just laughed and laughed and laughed. Yeah, we just had a big jack, big joke over that. <clears throat> Whose daughters were in, if you, good and not afraid with terror, then husbands likewise do it. So that's the passage. That's, that's what this is talking about here. But I want to, we usually stop reading 
I want to continue on here because it brings out a point that I want to emphasize today. In verse 8, finally all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, being tender-hearted, being courteous. Now listen, if it's telling you to be that way to the body of Christ, shouldn't you be that way to your spouse? Shouldn't you be courteous to your spouse? Not returning evil for evil, or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Now I want you to look at verse 11. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. One of the things, one of the key elements where a marriage is concerned is seek after peace. And I want to remind you of the biblical application of the word peace. When we think of the word peace, we think of a babbling brook, uh, waves crashing on the ocean, birds singing, and those are really nice, peaceful things. But the word peace in our Bible is far more powerful than that. The word peace, now I know the New Testament was written in Greek, but these are, these are Hebrew people that are talking. These are Jewish people that are talking. And so, when they're talking about peace, when Jesus said, My peace I leave with you, the word He was talking about is the word shalom. Now, shalom is not the Hebrew equivalent of aloha. In the South, our, our greeting is, Y'all pray for it. <laughs> That's I'll pray for you. That, 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 that's our hello, goodbye. That's everything. In, in Hawaii, aloha is hello, goodbye. And, and in Israel, shalom is hello, goodbye. Okay, shalom is a far more powerful word than that. The word shalom literally means nothing missing, nothing broken. So when you tell somebody shalom, you're, you're, you're pronouncing a blessing on them that says nothing missing, or nothing broken in your life. Everything in your life be whole and complete and entire. Well, does that sound something like John 10.10? 10? The thief comes not but for to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life, and you might have it abundantly till it overflows, that you be complete entire, nothing missing, nothing broken. That's what God's design for you is. Where your marriage is concerned, the enemy comes and attacks to pit you against one another to prevent that from happening. So dwell together in peace. Do y'all remember over in uh, uh, Exodus chapter 4, I think it is. Do you remember God's appeared to Moses and Moses has been on the backside of the desert. So burning bushes appeared. He's thrown his... Uh, or he's thrown his uh, uh, staff down, turned into a snake, he picked it up. Okay, so all that's happened. Uh, his you know, hand was leprous. and Okay, so, so, so he's now heading back to Egypt to deliver the people. And on the way in, he gets deathly sick and almost dies. Do y'all remember that? Okay, trust me, he does. You can read in Exodus chapter 4, this really happened. It's really in there. And so Zipporah, his wife goes and circumcises their two boys and brings the foreskins in and throws them at Moses. And she said, you're a bloody husband to me. Praise God. Let's just end the service right there. That's a good. My wife said this morning, she said, let's make sure the children aren't in there for this part. Thank you. The thing I want you to notice about that is Moses didn't realize what was happening. He, he is so focused on doing what it is that God's called him to do, he's heading back to Egypt to deliver God's people. And he starts getting sick and he doesn't realize what's going on. Zipporah picks up on it immediately. And what happened was this. Living on the backside of the desert... It may not have made a whole lot of difference whether the covenant had been observed or not. But the closer he got 
to the calling that God had on his life, the enemy started turning up the heat and would have used any entrance he could have to have killed Moses before he ever started. And so honoring that blood covenant, honoring the Abrahamic covenant, you understand the law of Moses had not been given yet. This is talking about the Abrahamic covenant. Honoring that Abrahamic covenant was really important before going into battle where the enemy was concerned. Zipporah recognized that and saved his life. You, you see, men, your wife can be sensitive to things that you don't see. Because men, we some, we, we, and we talked about this last week, we, we look at things differently. We kind of get that bulldog tunnel vision. And, and, and we get focused in on one thing and we get locked in on it. Women have this network of connections in their brain. They can, they can multitask like nobody's business. Men don't do that as well. We get focused on one thing and we, and, and, and we lock in on it. And that's what happened to Moses. He didn't realize what was going on around him. And, and, and it got him deathly sick. Now turn with me over to Ephesians chapter 5. And we'll look at another uh, section of Scripture here that deals with these things also. Verse 22. Now, those of you in here that, that I have performed your wedding ceremony, and there have, have been quite a few of you, we go, actually this passage of Scripture in here is in, in the wedding ceremony. And we go over in detail when, when we're doing counseling. We talk about the importance of this. And we talk about the importance of, of, of a husband and wife uh, drawing on one another and dwelling together in unity. Here it says, wives, submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. By the way, and, and this is one of the things that Beth pointed out last week. You know, when you're operating in agreement, when you're standing together in agreement, you don't need submission. Because you're in agreement. Submission comes in when you, when you can't get in agreement. And so to keep the flow of authority going, then submission is done. And, and think of it in, in military terms. Think of it the way that an order is given in the military. It, it, it starts from the top and it comes down through the ranks and there is a flow to that authority. And so if a captain gives an order to a private, actually it would be passed down the chain, but you'll understand. If, if a private, I mean a, a, a captain gives a private an order and then that private goes out and carries that out, whose authority is that private operating in? He's not operating in the authority of a private. He's operating in the authority of the one that gave him the commission, the one that told, gave him the order. Well, the same thing is true where a husband and wife are concerned. That flow of authority. Listen, husbands, you can submit yourself to your wife too. This may come as a shock to you, but there's times she's right. Oh, I can't believe I said that. Y'all don't let her know I said that, okay? But to keep that, there are times when you have a disagreement with one another, instead of you saying, bless God, woman, I'm the head of this house, which we learned that's not true. The wife's the head of the house. Uh, 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 bless God, woman, I'm the head of this house, and this is what we're going to do. It might behoove you to listen for a moment and recognize that what she's saying, you know, I'm, I'm thinking we probably need to do that. You want to keep that flow of authority operating in your, in, in, in your, in your life, in your household. If that private just goes off and does something on his own, he's only operating in the authority of a private, <laughs> which is not much authority. That's on the bottom level. So this is about keeping the flow of authority or power operating in your life, where your marriage is concerned, where your children are concerned. This is one of the reasons you need to have a good church. This is one of the reasons that you need a pastor in your life. I, you know, I've got a teaching. I hadn't done this in a long time either. But on what you're looking for in a church, we've got a, a, a teaching on what are you looking for in a church? Are you looking for a steeple? Are you looking for a pipe organ? Are you looking for a good choir? Or a good softball team? I mean, do they have a good softball team? Uh, you know, do they have a good youth program? Do they have good, uh, you know, I hear that church. I hear they have real good picnics. I think I'm going to go to that. Uh, what are you looking for in a church? Well, Jesus said what you're looking for is a shepherd. He said you're looking for a shepherd. And when you recognize the fact 
that a pastor that's doing what he's supposed to be doing, when he's operating the way that he's supposed to be operating, his desire is nothing but good things for you. Whenever he has the opportunity to speak into your life, it's to help you, not to boss you. It's to help you. And some people have a hard time recognizing that. They think, well, he's just trying to tell me what to do. No, I'm trying to share with you what the Word says so that it will address the problem that you came and talked to me about in the first place. I I know, my goodness, y'all aren't going to believe this, but there there have been times, in in a few times, but I, I remember when Andrew was playing baseball, Little League Baseball, and I had told him that I will coach him up until you get into school ball. And I did that. I actually had the opportunity to coach my grandsons, too, until they got up. So that's a lot of fun. So they call me Coach Papa. <laughs> I'll be out now sometimes and some of the little kids that were on the team. Coach Papa! <laughs> okay. So, uh, but I was coaching Andrew, and, and he had gotten into a batting slump. Now, Andrew was a very good hitter. He was a very good baseball player. And, and he had gotten into a hitting slump. And so I, I spent time working with him, and I, I watched him. And, and, and uh, you know, at that time, everybody didn't have phones out there uh, uh, recording everything. You know, you actually had to watch. And so I was watching, trying to pick up some little, you know, little things that he was doing that I could help him. So we got in the batting cages, and we made some adjustments. And, I mean, man, he started, he got, he got his eye back on the ball, started making good contact. So we're playing a, we're playing a game. And uh, so he goes up to bat, <clears throat> and I'm coaching third base. And he goes up to bat, and I, I just kind of look in there, and I notice he has this, he, he, he doesn't even have his normal stance. I thought, well, that's odd. And, and, and he takes three strikes at the ball, he strikes out. Looks terrible. And so, I, 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 you know, I, I said, Andrew, I said, we worked on that. You were hitting the ball well. What are you doing? He said, well, I was talking to Billy, and he told me I ought to start doing some things, and he told me if I'd try this, I'd do better. You know those cartoons where you see where the people where steam comes out of their ears and their hat goes, yeah, that's probably what I looked like at that time. Because I was thinking, we spent this time, and, and somebody that loves you and cares for you and wants you to have success spent time with you to work with you and to help you where this is, and we had it fixed. And you listened to some little 12-year-old that doesn't know, I mean, he's one of the worst hitters on the team, and he's giving you advice and you listen to him. Yes, I was not pleased. But Andrew, being a good son, son, took that instruction, and uh, we, we, got th- we got things back on the right track. Well, you know, the same through is where, where church is concerned. There are times over the years I, that, that I've had people that have come, uh, couples that have come to me where their marriage is concerned. Ah, uh, Pastor Seymour. Pastor Seymour, you just don't know how tough it is. You just don't know. Pastor Seymour, you just don't, you just don't know how, 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 how stubborn and, 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 and how independent she is. And I just laugh and laugh and laugh. Because, see, you see Miss Beth now after 40-something years of marriage. You didn't see her when we first got married. And, and you know, well, you don't have problems like that in, in your life, in your marriage. Well, we don't now. But there were things we had to walk through just like everybody. So when we're sitting there talking to him, my desire when I'm sitting there talking to a couple is, is to fix the problem, to share with them what the Word says, and them, you know, to have joy and peace back in their marriage. And I have to say this. As of today, and I've been doing this at this church for 29 years. As of today at this church, the couples that I have, that have done what I've told them to do, it worked out. Everyone without exception. Why? Because I'm some hot shot? Nope. Because all I do is show them what the Word says. They start acting on the Word, and the power that's contained within the Word fixes the problem. Also, without exception, the ones that haven't done that, never made it. And I'm, I'm thinking, and this, is, this happened more than one time, but I'm thinking of one time in particular. I'm sitting here talking to somebody in my office. They came up here, bless their heart, crying. And, 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 I, I said, and, and so Beth and I talked with them. And I told him, I said, this is, this, if you'll do this, 
It'll fix what's going on right now. I promise you, it'll work. Okay, okay, Pastor, I'll do it, I'll do it. So they leave, and about a day or two later, I get a call from the husband. You're not going to believe what she did. Da, da, da. And I was thinking, there is no way she did. That's the exact opposite of what I told her to do. Well, I found out later that when she left here, she called her friend. And her friend said, I tell you one thing, I wouldn't do that if I were you. If it was me, I'd do so and so and so and so and so. And the wheels came flying up. Actually, it never recovered. They wound up getting divorced. Never recovered. If you're having problems in your marriage, don't go to your buddies talking about it. Okay? Your buddies don't know what they're talking about. Everybody's an expert. You know, you get around men, I tell you what, my old lady did that to me. I do so and so. Yeah, you talk big down here, but I bet you wouldn't say that in front of her. Men are just like that. Women the same way. They, they talk differently. You know, they, they, they get a lot bolder until the two of you get around one another. A minister, a pastor, is, uh, is, is going to speak the Word into your life that will help you. That's really important. By the way, have I, have I mentioned that there are two institutions in the Bible? The first one is the family. The second one's the church. So the attacks that you're going to have in your life are primarily going to come in your family and where your church or your pastor is concerned. There are going to be things that come against you to try to divide your family and things that try to divide you from your church or your pastor. So you've got to pay attention. And it's to rob you of your authority. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now see right there, it says, wives be subject to their husband as, as, as the church is to Christ. What is the relationship? Is, is the relationship that the church has with Jesus so that Jesus can lord over the church and put the church under His thumb? No! When we look at, we know that Jesus' desire for us is nothing but good. And that should be the way that things operate in the family. Listen, one of the, one of the most valuable things, and I, I, I'm, I don't know that I wouldn't say it's the most valuable thing in, in a marriage, is trust. Trust is something that typically is not just given completely. It has to be earned. And that trust can be destroyed in a moment. And sometimes never regained. It is such a valuable thing to be able to trust one another. Do you trust Jesus? Do you trust that Jesus desires and has good things for you? And that as you submit yourself to the Word, which is the way that we find out what His will is, is by submitting to the Word. By doing that, don't you know that that operates together for our good? Yes. So is the same way with that relationship with a husband and a wife. The husband's desire for the wife should be only good. And she should know that. That's one of the reasons that, it's, that, that, that adultery, infidelity, adultery, is so devastating to a marriage. Because when that is committed, it's like treason in the marriage. And it'll destroy it. Because what has happened, if the woman is the one that's committed adultery, then remember the number one thing that a man desires is honor. And so what has happened is she has dishonored him. And men, a lot of men can never recover from that. And a woman, if the man is the one that's been uh, unfaithful, her, the thing that, number one thing in her life that she desires is security. Well, that's just destroyed her security. So it will wreak havoc in a marriage. And I have to tell you, it's a very difficult thing to recover from. I mean, you can say, I forgive you, but that hurt, that wound is still deep down on the inside. And it takes the love of God and the power of the Spirit of God to be able to fix that. It's not just some little thing that you, 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 you treat just like, you know, just like it's nothing. And okay, well, you know, they forgave me, so 
No, there has to be a change in attitude. There has to be a change in direction. There has to be repentance. Because that trust has been violated. Listen, don't, don't, don't do that. Don't do things in your marriage that cause your spouse to question or to have trust issues. They are very difficult to recover from. So don't give that, don't even give the appearance of it where your marriage is concerned. Husbands, love your wives, Christ loved the church, gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it, cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh and nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects or honors her husband. This is a picture. When you, when you look at the picture of a marriage, the best example of it is looking at the relationship of Jesus and the church. And, and remember, men, that the head, when it says that we're the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, the word head doesn't mean boss. The word head means the object of which something is a reflection. So Christ is the head of the church. He is the object that the church reflects. When you look at the church, you ought to see Jesus. So in the household, that begins with the husband. When you look at the husband, he should be reflecting Jesus to his family. So, men, you're the object that your wife is going to reflect. If you don't like what she's reflecting, then change. I mean, if you don't like the way she's acting, change what she's reflecting. Now, the thing I want to leave you with this morning, and it, it, it's actually over in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're not going to turn there. But I, I know that I've gone a little bit long this morning. The Bible tells us where marriage is concerned to follow after peace. And 1 Corinthians chapter 7 deals with what if you're married to an unsaved person? The Bible says to follow after peace. It says, what if that person wants to depart? Paul says, let them depart. But follow after peace in your marriage. Peace is really important where your marriage is concerned. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Dwelling together in unity allows the Spirit, the power of God, to operate completely so that you're able to do the things that God's called you to do, that you can operate together as heirs together of the grace of life. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Well, thank you very much for coming out today and being a part of our service. My desire for you is that God's richest and best are yours. And remember, there's victory in Jesus. Amen.